Hello, everyone. So my name is Wes Bush. I'm the host of the Product Led Summit. And today I'm so excited to share with you Scott, who is the senior team lead of user acquisition at HubSpot. And today we're going to be talking about a really cool topic that I'm so excited about, which is all about how HubSpot approaches their freemium acquisition. So we're going to touch a little bit on freemium, but also really just diving into how Scott really thinks about user acquisition like an investment portfolio and what are some things that you can really do and walk away from uh, whenever it comes to setting up your user acquisition strategy for success. And so before we really dive in here, I just want to hear from Scott and really hear how he got into user acquisition at Obspot. Like, tell us how you got to where you were, Scott. Yeah, uh, the short answer is it was one giant mistake. Uh, <laughs> so I, I guess I graduated from school and worked for a startup in uh, Los Angeles. And the original plan was, hey, go and run these events at different college campuses. So that was what I wanted to do. Uh, my dream was doing like front of house audio engineering at like a huge music festival out of college. I was like, oh, my God, that's the best job ever. And then I work for this startup and they're like, so yeah, we're not actually going to do that anymore, but um, are you open to, to running our blog? I'm like, uh, like, a, like a mommy blog? I don't know. I don't really know what that means, but sh sure, I guess I can like read about it. <laughs> so the, that's how I got introduced to like blogging, so to speak, in content marketing. Did that for six months, left, went to go work for... Um, a really, really good uh, SEO and content marketing agency called Siege Media. It's ran by uh, this guy, Ross Hudgens, who's amazing. Great guy. Um, yeah. Yep. Worked for him for about a year and then uh, got a job offer at HubSpot. Um, and then kind of my evolution at HubSpot, I worked uh, in content marketing. So we had a product called Sidekick. All that did is it tracked when someone else opened your email. Um, and there's another very smart guy named Brian Belfour. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with Brian. Um, and he was just like really, he graciously, uh, I would say, took a risk on me and like extended me a job offer uh, for the ability to work remotely, which I have been at HubSpot for like a little under five years now. And yeah, started in content marketing, would work on the blog and I'm um, trying to get as much engagement up as possible. And uh, one really interesting takeaway we actually had from that blog is after focusing on it for probably a year and a half, and we're like, okay, this is going to be our customer acquisition channel. It wasn't. It actually didn't do a great job at acquiring users. What it did a great job with um, is retention. And so as we had more and more, uh, we ran like a correlation between who are the people who are reading the content and who are the people who are using the product and how does reading the content pull them back into the product we actually did see um like a pretty significant correlation with that which i thought was super interesting um and yeah and then kind of from there went on from uh, my main job was how do we automate the sales funnel in like a, a very very low touch to no touch way to where you know we have thousands and thousands of people signing up every month there's no way we can have a sales rep talking to every person so how do we automate that and then we we built um i think wes you've talked about this a little bit the product qualified lead like yeah definitely um yeah we like experimented with all these different product qualified lead, lead touch points did that for a while uh then we launched a customer service product and then i worked on that with um, a guy at hubspot named alex burkett who's awesome and then we've kind of transitioned to, uh, I've since transitioned to running more of the greater user acquisition for, for all of the different product lines at HubSpot. Interesting. And so I love how you really just started with the blogging approach and really just making that you thought at that point, you're like, this is the channel. And then it, it wasn't the best driver for it. And so I'm curious, like, what was it? for Sidekick where you started noticing like this is driving the majority of our users. Yeah, uh, one interesting one, uh, there's another guy I was spawning, Rex Gelb. Um, he was the, 
like the paid guy. You know, he was the paid acquisition guy at HubSpot for a really long time. And you go back to, to 2013, 2014, and we and we introduced the idea of let's use paid acquisition to pull in new users to HubSpot, which is like, you know, paid acquisition is the antichrist of of marketing right now. You know, because that was how we positioned the entire business is that paid is disruptive. Um, it's not acceptable to like be blasting out ads at people. And now we're like acquiring most of our users through paid acquisition um, from Sidekick. We tried to get content marketing to work. Uh, the data didn't show us that it necessarily pulled in more users. Is there some like dark attribution? Probably. Um, and we also tried to get virality to click and we couldn't quite get that to the point we wanted it to. Um, but we did, we did do a pretty good job on like cross promoting through other HubSpot mediums, you know, cause at the time HubSpot's getting millions and millions of page views every single month. Yeah. So we can like cross promote via other, um, parts of like the blog, the actual HubSpot blog. So it was a separate blog at the time. Um, long story short, paid was actually a huge driver at the very beginning. Um, and so much of it was actually spent, at least on the growth team, really working on retention and activation. Um, okay. Yeah. Interesting. And so whenever you're thinking about how to acquire a lot of users and also make sure they're, they're actually good ones who end up using the product and actually purchasing it. How do you approach your user acquisition strategy? I know you mentioned, uh, when we were talking a little bit earlier, you approach this like an investment portfolio, but I'd love to just hear your thoughts about this and really um, kind of understand it. Yeah, totally. Um, but depends on the product. I'll give HubSpot for the example. Um, but anyone who's listening who's not HubSpot, which is probably most people listening, uh, <laughs> my favorite framework for starting off with like, okay, how are we going to get people to find out about a product and sign up for a product if it's freemium or maybe free trial, if it's free trial or whatever your goal is and whatever you consider uh, top of funnel acquisition. My favorite framework is from Ramit Sethi. And it's this notion that he calls go where the fish are. And, and it's, it's very obvious and very simple in hindsight, but it's such a good mental model and mental framework for thinking about user acquisition to where, you know, imagine you have three different ponds and you go fishing at one pond and there's all these people fishing at one pond and everyone's getting like one or two fish. And then you go to the next pond and you're getting no fish. And you're like, okay, well, I guess that first pond was better. But then there's this hidden pond off in the woods. And you're the one who finds it. And it's this like secret fishing hole. And you're just pulling fish out left and right and left and right. And because you've found you. And then you just stay there. You don't go to a different you don't go to the first pond. You don't go to the second pond. You stay at that pond until you are pulling all the fish out that you possibly can. Um, and that's ultimately like his model for thinking about how do I get people to find out about my product? If you're a startup, that's done a lot more scrappy. You don't have a high domain authority, so you can kiss SEO goodbye. It's not going to happen anytime soon for you. Um, but what you can do is go on like forums, um, like Reddit, Quora that kind of stuff. Um, if there's any type of niche community that's out there, building to that. Um, and then paid, of course, is huge. And kind of getting like some form of uh, incentivized virality. Joe, um, we have a podcast called Growth TLDR and we did a growth, um, an episode with Joe, who's the founder. Of, and he talks a lot about uh, virality like on that show and how incentivized virality sort of worked a little bit, but not great. Uh, and so, and that was interesting as far as like when you're early, because Loom was a very, is, well, they're a little more mature now, but they were very early. And so that was one of the mechanisms that they used was incentivized virality. So anyone out there, I would say that is a very prominent one. Um, but yeah, Wes, going back to your question, 
your, uh, it's like, how would you think about user acquisition, you know, at the very start? Ultimately, use that go where the fish are mindset um, to identify like, all right, where are those ponds, so to speak, where my fish are at? But I can talk about how we think about it at HubSpot in particular with our model we have right now, if that would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Go for it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, ultimately, we think about our user acquisition like a, an investment portfolio, so to speak. So the majority of users come to HubSpot from two channels, um, organic and paid. So we have a lot of signups that are coming in from organic and a lot of signups that are coming in from Facebook, AdWords, and any variant of paid acquisition that we have today. So it's awesome because it's extremely scalable and we're constantly figuring out new ways to like grow the number of users we're getting from organic and grow the number of users we're getting through paid through like different experiments, so to speak. Uh, paid, we run a ton of experiments. Organic, it's somewhat difficult to run structured experiments through that because there's a lot of variables that are uncontrolled that are kind of subject to algorithms. So we think about that. We have paid in when organic, but we also want to diversify it. So just like with an investment portfolio, you don't want to um, buy, you don't want to have 40% uh, of your stock in your portfolio in Tesla and the other 30% of your, of your stock in Amazon. Because like, well, while, while, while Tesla's probably not a good example now, but uh, <laughs> while, they're, while they're both, um, maybe Google and Facebook, you know, literally, because uh, <laughs> that's the same thing. While they both could grow, continually you know it's still risky because if one thing happens to the company it could completely tank and it's the same thing for us if we get hit with like a penalty or if we get hit with some mass algorithm change that impacts that totally contradicts all the work we've been doing then that could hurt us and so what we, we try to do is diversify a little bit and so we want to come up with different acquisition channels um such as like trying to get uh, affiliate to work in some way, shape or form, trying to get virality to work in some way, shape or form. Uh, we have like a third acquisition channel that I can't quite disclose, but we're trying to get that one to work as well. Um, and then a, a fourth one, which uh, I can talk about a little bit if you want called like the surround sound strategy, which is, um, all from Alex Burkett, who's also at HubSpot, I think I mentioned earlier. Yep. Um, yeah, so it's like we want to acquire as many users as we can, and we want to double down what works. We want to go where the fish are. We don't want to leave that pond until all the fish are pulled out. But it's also risky because once you pull all the fish out of that one pond, like you need to hedge your bets a little bit, and you need to be able to know where the next pond is, so to speak. Okay, and so as you're thinking about developing some of those new channels, whether it's virality or uh, even some of those secret ones, I mean, how do you really go about prioritizing? And really, even with your budget, for instance, I mean, if we're comparing this apples to apples with an investment portfolio, I know a lot of smart investors will put maybe five to 10% of their money in a place where they just like, if we lose it, that's okay. But this 10% could really be the, the next 90% of our growth. So how do you go about that from like a even budget planning perspective and really diversifying your risk? Yeah, uh, you kind of nailed it. Uh, it's almost like we have a VC mindset with acquisition um, where it's like, probably most of the bets aren't going to quite work out, but if we can get one of them to work out and there's a lot of potential for scale, that's incredible. Um, and that's really what we're looking for is finding that one that has a lot of potential for scale and then doubling down on that. As far as budget allocation, how do we think about it? We still have most of our resources going into organic and paid, but we have a couple people and or small teams that are thinking through, through these more innovative newer acquisition channels um so as far as budget goes we're probably looking at about 10 percent ish is like <clears throat> obsessively thinking about new 
user acquisition through these like particular channels versus just kind of keep cranking out on um, the two channels that are really working for us right now. Definitely. And so one of the things that I, I've seen again and again, especially talking to so many people at the Product Led Summit, is founders just using your product as the acquisition tool. I mean, there was at the last summit, there was Olaf who's going through the, the way he really just built Mixmax off the back of freemium users. And it's really incredible just how you can really build your product and have it acquire more users for you that are also high quality. So I'm, I'm curious, like how have you really tried to approach that and build a product that acquires users for HubSpot? Yeah. Um, so one of our v VPs of marketing, his name's Kieran Flanagan uh, at HubSpot. Uh, he's said this before. He's, he's like, freemium i think kieran has said this before hopefully i'm not misquoting him if not i'm saying it on his behalf uh <laughs> um freemium is a marketing mechanism it's not a product mechanism um because you want to ultimately instead of your landing page selling someone that this is worth it the product sells them that this is worth it you know so people can actually sell themselves on the fact that, you know, I should buy this because of the value that they've actually gotten from the product versus this landing page is pretty convincing. There's a lot of social proof. It seems like a lot of legitimate companies are using this. The reviews are really good. Okay. I guess I'll give it a shot, which is good, but also not as productive. When we kind of introduced the freemium model, we were getting ballpark 3x the uh, output um, is about 3x as efficient as not having a freemium model as far as upgrades go uh, just because we're and it, it there's varying levels throughout that um, you know someone signing up to be a new user uh, is more or less like a lead gen form but once someone the really interesting thing about freemium is you have these engagement factors that go into it. Whereas the old school um, inbound marketing playbook is write a blog, have an ebook, people download the ebook and sales reaches out. Um, and so when people are downloading the ebook, what is their engagement? And how engaged are they with um, whatever it is that you're selling? And that can be a little difficult to tell if you, there is software that will help you um, learn what are all the different touch points on the website that people are going to and how are they interacting on the website. But the interesting thing with freemium is you can say, how are they interacting with the product? And we can look at correlations between features that people are using and the likelihood that they're going to upgrade. And so then we can, with onboarding, we can push them towards those features and getting heavier and heavier usage of the ones that have the strongest correlation with likelihood to upgrade. So there's a lot of like factors that have kind of gone into the, the freemium yeah. model at HubSpot. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it's, it's one thing that we are uh, started off as one giant experiment with Sidekick and like Brian Belfort kind of leading the charge on that one and has evolved into like the entire company um, slowly pulling more and more products down into a freemium tier just because yeah. it, it, it makes sense. Um, and frankly, the numbers show that it works for us. Yeah. And what you really made me think about one thing, just in terms of the market in general, I mean, there's, there's content marketing and I feel like, yeah, it, it had its heyday. And now it's just getting like, you have the 10X, your 10X content. I mean, there's also growth hacking where you go look at that trends. And as soon as there's one big hack and everyone else finds out about it, it's not really that effective anymore. And so in terms of just like, what is that the next lead magnet? Like, would you really say that like freemium or free trial is the top lead magnet to have like coming up if you are building a SaaS business? Mm, it depends. 
huge fan of like binary yes or no it's you know freemium is the future or uh freemium is dead you know like those kind of clickbait articles that were always seen pop up it just depends like it works for some business models it doesn't work for other business models it largely depends on who the audience is so for example if you have an enterprise level audience and you're introducing a freemium product it's like yeah sure it's that's cool that they get to try it before they buy it but ultimately for an enterprise company to switch products like that at least at an, an organizational level not at a this has helped me being productive in my personal job or personal life you know like a simple chrome extension or something that is like really quick time to value if you have something that's a long time to value and requires switching from one platform to the other and your audience is like a larger enterprise or it's a bigger decision i mean it's not a like if you have a freemium product it, it doesn't really make that big of a difference because your audience is going to go through a full sales cycle anyway, like a full B2B sales cycle anyway, analyzing what are the different options. Like everyone has a free trial at least. So they get to try the product. They get to feature compare. There's a lot more discussions internally that will happen. So if you have a full platform product, um, freemium can work. Um, you know, HubSpot largely is a platform product, so it can work, but we have like a larger uh, segment of audience where we have really small companies that start to use freemium and then the bigger companies come in and they want the more advanced feature set anyway so they go th go through a full sales cycle so is it the best lead magnet ever yeah if you have like a smaller if small biz is your target audience mm -hmm. or if you're if you're b2c um you know of course that's like pretty solid like headspace for example um yeah, so it depends. Uh, but yeah, ho I, I don't like giving the answer. It depends. So hopefully that like additional context is helpful. Oh, definitely. It, it's always going to be one of those questions where yeah. <laughs> it gets to the point where yeah, it really just does depend. Yeah. And yeah, I like that view on it. But I guess this is a last question. Like if someone was to uh, just starting out for their user acquisition, like what are some of the first things you recommend like is there a another like mental model or something you recommend for someone to really um dive into or apply to their user acquisition strategy yeah um we always have you know new people starting at hubspot all the time and then people will just reach out from other companies and just ask the same question like what should i do like what should i get involved in uh the very first thing I would say is scratch the surface on everything, um, but put a time limit on it. So if you're just starting off your career, so to speak, in marketing or user acquisition, just dabble in like SEO and paid acquisition. Um, those are the two, honestly, that I would start in. And then with SEO, you can kind of subdivide that into technical SEO and more content-driven SEO. My background is content-driven SEO. Um, and like a little bit of the social SC or social content side of things of like, how do you get things to work um, with like via PR, via social or whatever. And then start to figure out like, what is the most interesting for you? And then double down on that and get good at that. Um, because you basically need to be able to provide some value to um the company when you're first starting out so whether that's you're a great writer which can work for content marketing or content driven seo you learn the technical seo side of things um you learn about paid acquisition and that kind of means like segments bidding uh doing ad creative copywriting that kind of stuff uh, you can work on that just pick something and double down on it for at least like a year or two and get good at that one thing. And then you can kind of pivot from there. If you're like, you know what? Paid acquisition sucks. Like I'm not really into this anymore. Then you can always take the skills you learned and move on to a different area. If you want to stay in marketing or, you know, it could be like a complete step shift. You want to go be a product, product manager somewhere. Um, you can, you just want to, um, like my favorite mental model, uh, which I've learned again, like from Brian Belfort, is one foot in the known and one foot in the unknown. 
So do that thing that you're really, really good at and because you need to always be providing some value in one way, shape or form. But also like you should be experimenting with these new things that are interesting for you, interesting to you and whatnot. You just don't have a great skill set in those yet, but you can learn them while you're kind of keeping one foot in the known and one foot in the unknown. I like it. And it really goes against a lot of people whenever they say like, just niche down, niche down, niche down. And it's like, it's true. You should at eventually one point, but you should start broad first and really just try some things because you don't know if something uh, like copywriting or SEO is just going to be your thing where you naturally just gravitate towards it. And so, yeah, I love that piece of advice. And yeah. Th- there's a uh, like, kind of the last thing that um, I'll just leave out on is we think about uh, as far as like career development goes, this is how I think about career development. And I think this is a framework that we continually uh, use at HubSpot. So imagine a three part Venn diagram. It's one, uh, what are you good at? What do you want to be better at? And what does the business need? And so the the goal is to find something that's in the intersection of all of those. You're good at it. You want to be better at it and the business needs it. But if you fall into something where like you're good at it and the business needs it, that's great, but it's short term because you don't have that motivation to stick with it over the long term because you don't care about it. Whereas like you want to get better at it, but you're not good at it, but the business needs it you're not really providing any value because you don't have the skill set there yet. And so you need to like spend your spare time working towards that thing to where moving it from, I want to get better at it and I'm good at it and the business needs it. So yeah, kind of that three-part Venn diagram is, uh, has been a very helpful model for thinking through like career progression and whatnot. Yeah. And so finding what, which one you can you compromise on is <laughs> yeah. it the motivation is it the business outcome or uh, is it yeah. the other one? So yeah, yeah. Always that fine balance. <laughs> and so I know we're, we're at the end of our, our discussion, but I really just want to ask like, where can um, people learn more about you and some of the great stuff you're up to at HubSpot? Yeah. Uh, thanks for asking. We, so I do a podcast with our Kieran Flanagan who works at HubSpot as well. Uh, that podcast is called Growth TLDR. That's probably the the fastest way or the best way just to keep a pulse on like the stuff that we're doing and stuff that we're working on. Uh, and if you have questions and you want to talk to me personally, uh, my website's, it's just my name, scotttowsley.com. And there's a little live chat widget in the corner and you can just send me a message which goes to my phone. Perfect. And one of the things I will mention about the Growth TLDR podcast is that it's just a really fun podcast. I mean, there is a lot of growth podcasts out there, but it's it's really hard to have that balance where it's like, where is that kind of entertaining um, really presenters as well as you're learning something from it. And so I felt like you guys, both Scott and Kieran, have done a fantastic job of just finding that balance of uh, where is that entertaining side of the business outcome? It's not all serious, but it's also <laughs> still really useful. So kudos to you guys for putting that together. It's great. Yeah, thanks. And uh, and anyone who's not aware, Wes was on the show recently too. Uh, so go ahead and search for that episode with Wes and definitely listen to it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Scott, for hanging out on this call. This has been a great chat. Cool. Thanks, Wes. All right. Bye.